So in this segment, we're going to be, I'm going to be asking the audience a question really is, do you think Russia is lying about not only what is happening to their troops in Ukraine, which, you know, we've seen the death numbers, they don't seem accurate, but lying to their troops and also the families of their troops about if they're being deployed in an active war zone. Because I've read now, I've seen this um, transcript, you know, there was a video in the from the UN where the Ukrainian ambassador uh, talked about how essentially, um, you know, a Russian, Russian uh, soldier was lied to before his deployment. You know, they were told they were going for training sessions and instead they were deployed into Ukraine. And I read through this transcript and I was like, this feels like S-grade propaganda, like the kind of really, the things that really pull at your heartstrings. But then I read more and more stories like this and I was thinking, is this, you know, is this, could this be wartime propaganda? Or is this actually happening? Because that would make sense as to why these Russian soldiers are struggling so much. Um, in one regard, anyway, if they're sending a bunch of, not, uh, you know, a bunch of you know amateurs, conscripts, really, people who haven't had proper training, you know, who haven't been told, you know, the what it's like in an active war zone, things like that. Um, you know, not only are the logistics a massive problem for Russia, which is very surprising. Um, but yeah, you know, we'll, we'll go through the video now and you, let me know what you guys think. There's going to be, you know, the title won't be the usual kind of title because I'm genuinely asking a question here, which is, are, are Russians lying to, um, you know, their soldiers about being put into active war zones? So this is the transcript and we'll watch the actual video from the, uh, uh, from the UN at the end of this, uh, video, which is why have you taken so long since you last responded? Are you really in training exercise? This is the mother's, um, texting the, uh, son, I believe, and he says, "Mum, I'm no longer in Crimea. I I'm not in training sessions." She said, "Where are you?" Papa is asking whether I can send you a parcel. What kind of parcel, um, Mama? Can you send me? I just want to hang myself now. And she said, "What are you talking about? What happened?" He goes, "I'm in Ukraine. There's a real war raging here. I'm afraid we are bombing all of the cities, which we know that to be true. That Russia are shelling cities." even targeting civilians, which that does seem to be true as well. We were told that we'd be welcome, they would welcome us and they are falling under our armoured vehicles, which we've seen videos of that, uh, throwing themselves under the wheels and not allowing us to pass. They call us fascist, mama. This is so hard. And I wasn't sure. That's why I didn't cover this because, you know, you always get wartime propaganda. But then you see more and more stories like this from, you know, parents, predominantly mothers who have sent their whose um, sons have been sent to um, to war in Ukraine. And I was just like, could this could this really be could this be true? Like, uh, are Russia becoming that desperate or do they not have a modernized military like, you know, a, you know, a massive military like, you know, for example, like the US or even the UK, for example, we don't have the biggest military in the world um, through numbers. But evidently the Russian military hasn't is not that big either. So this the Russian go um, the uh, governor of Siberia who was confronted by um, citizens of his uh, constituency. So a Russian governor in Siberia has been confronted by angry citizens who blamed him for deploying a local riot police unit to Ukraine to become cannon fodder. And for anyone who doesn't know, you don't deploy riot riot police don't work in active war zones. Maybe you can send them in after you've taken the area and you've fully secured it. So there's you know no little to no military resistance talking like absolutely nothing because the most riot police can deal with are um you know not even molotov cocktails not really stones and things like that um so it's just you know i read this story i think this is this is insane and this is from the um 8th of march um so i did i did wait a while before covering this really uh, from the original story the footage first posted by radio free uh, europe on monday showed a fire exchange between sergey um i'm, I'm not gonna pronounce the second name we'll just call him sergey um, the governor of um, Kemerovo region, the people in the um, city of Nova Kuznets, sorry, Russian words, they lied to everyone, they, de they deceived everyone, why did you send them there? One woman asked the governor, saying that the soldiers thought they were going for military drills in Belarus. And so, if we go back here, this gentleman was saying he was sent for training exercises. We don't know where, but they wouldn't be training in Ukraine. So if we assume this gentleman was meant to be in Russia, which would make sense why they would send him a parcel, or even in Belarus, um, that would make more sense. But, you know, they were told they were being sent to the Belarus border, probably for defensive purposes. Maybe Russia, you know, maybe they spun it as Russia was fearing an invasion via Belarus to go to uh, go into Russia. 
So that doesn't, you know, it, it's just insane. Um, there's one woman asked the governor saying the soldiers thought they were going for military drills, so they didn't think they were going to be sent to an active war zone. She says they didn't know their objecti objective. They were sent as cannon fodder, the woman adds. The governor would not have been responsible for the decision to deploy the unit, so he would have been told, look, we just need um, people, you know, uh, for... Uh, quote military you know drills and whatever and he's like i've got riot police you can take and you know if this carries on you know the more angry these people become the more this area would wish they kept their riot police because you, you don't mess with you don't mess with people's kids man which would um have been a, which would have been made by the country's national guard so it could be the case that russia are that desperate that you know we've heard stories about them sending conscripts in where they've gone to you know people in russia said um, look, you know, um, you know, if you want to join the military, or whatever, um, you'll get paid X amount and blah blah blah. Um, you'll only be taken for drills, and that'll be it. We, there's a story about that. We'll talk about it in a few minutes, but they've sent riot police to an active war zone. By the looks of it, it's just crazy. They would have no training for this. Um, a separate. So the uh, National Guard is a separate internal military force directly subordinated to the President Vladimir Putin. So it very much looks like a decision that's come from the top. According to Radio Free Europe, the confrontation took place on Saturday at the gymnasium of the training base for the right police units, some of whose um, officers were killed or captured in Ukraine. So that that pretty much confirms it that if these if these soldiers were if these right police. Uh, were captured in Ukraine, that further confirms that they were sent into an active war zone, which they should not have been, because that's not the role of riot police. As the fighting in Ukraine nears its third week, more and more relatives of killed and captured Russians have expressed their opposition to the war, saying their uh, loved ones were not told in advance about the country's plans to invade Ukraine. So essentially, it looks like, um, the, the, you know, Russia, the Russian internal agency said, oh, look, we're just going to go for uh, military drills, maybe in Belarus or wherever. And they weren't told that there were going to be a Russian invasion. Obviously, Russia wouldn't tell their citizens in advance um, there would be a Russian invasion if they wouldn't do it by surprise. But these people had no idea. And this, this further leads to why there's going to be uh, more internal problems in Russia, that these people were never told about this. They were never conditioned for war. Not really. You know, how many, by the sounds of it, how many Russian people said, oh, you know, there are Nazis in um, Ukraine. We need to go there and fight. That didn't happen. Western military experts have raised questions about Russian troop morale and preparedness in Ukraine, which could explain Moscow's blitzkrieg plan to overthrow Ukraine and take Kiev has so far killed. You know, they thought they were going to go in there, get a quick win, and, and that would be it. But, you know, the more dragged out this war becomes, the more chance Russia have of really losing it. The only major concern I have is can Ukraine hold the lines, really? That's that's the major that's the major concern I have. Russia has revealed very little about the state of its soldiers. They said you know, at the time of this article, only 498 Russian soldiers had died in Ukraine. Um, Ukraine's military claimed it was 11,000. So the number would be somewhere in between that, no doubt. But we know Russia struggling to invade um, Ukraine, They're struggling massively. Um, they may take Kiev from from the south, but that's a far sh uh, longer journey than the original they route they took via Belarus. In the video, the governor defended the invasion, saying that Russian actions in Ukraine shouldn't be criticised. Why? Why shouldn't they be criticised? It's almost like you live in an authoritarian dictatorship where criticism is not allowed. Look, you can shout and blame everyone right now, but I think that while a military operation is in process, one shouldn't make any conclusions. Cool. Do you say that about other countries? If uh, when the US invasion of Vietnam happened, would you have said, oh, we shouldn't criticise the American military invasion, we shouldn't come to any conclusions? No, I don't think you would, pal. But I guess he has to say this, otherwise he might get arrested. Russian officials, as well as state media, have been referring to Russia's invasion of Ukraine as a special military operation rather than a war. You know, they're trying to make the point, they're trying to claim that Russia, I mean, Ukraine is run by neo-Nazis and like the Azov Battalion are like running everything, which isn't the case. I mean, the leader of their country, Zelensky, is Jewish. He had relatives killed in the Holocaust. How, why would a bunch of neo-Nazis let a Jewish person run their country? It doesn't make sense. If neo-Nazis ran Ukraine... Why would their leader be Jewish? Like, come on, man. Honestly. Authorities have also introduced a number of new laws aimed at stifling public opposition to the war. Because I think, you know, I think if I were Vlad, I'd be scared of internal revolts. Uh, we've seen it before. You know, World War One, a far bigger war, and, you know, Russian losses were far higher. But you had um, Lenin, who basically ran against the Tsar, um, promising peace, land, and bread, and he won. 
So, you know, Russia are going to be, you know, Vlad's going to be very concerned about internal efforts, especially as we found out, you know, the morning of recording this video that Roman Abramovich has been sanctioned. And, you know, the more you sanction these oligarchs, the more they're going to call Vlad and say, look, man, they froze my money because of you. You need to do something. Stop this war. And, you know, the longer that situation drags on, the more chance there is um, for someone to um, try and overthrow him internally. Not saying it's going to happen, but there's a chance of it. Um, they go on to say that young boys um, are thrown like cannon fodder, and most importantly, for what? For palaces in um, Galenzik, that's in uh, Russia. The close family member of the captured uh, sniper, um, Lenoid Paktishkev, said referring to the palatial mansion on the Black Sea that Russian independent journalists have said is linked to Putin. And it's valid that, you know, they're going to ask questions because they're seeing pictures. There's, in this article, right, it's, it's actual madness, right? In this article, they talk about how um, th their family members were lied to and they've seen pictures on Facebook of their relative captured in Ukraine. It's crazy. The Russian, you know, Russian agencies are lying to these people, even though they've seen hard evidence of, um, you know, their family member or their loved one being deployed in Ukraine. So uh, Putin has directly addressed the mothers of soldiers serving in Ukraine, telling them, I know how worried you are and trying to re reassure them. But some mothers, grandmothers, sisters and girlfriends have been telling the BBC they are desperately anxious about loved ones in the military. Young men who appear to have little idea what they're being sent into because they would have no idea they're being sent into an active war zone. So all these names have been changed. Um, when Marie, um, Marina hadn't heard from her grandson for more than a week, she started making calls. In the final message to her, he said he was on the Belarus-Ukraine border. And we know that um, the Russians invaded from that Belarus border. But we've known you since she fears the worst. Um, she said, I phoned his military unit. They said he hadn't left Russia. I said, are you joking? He contacted me from Belarus. Do you not know where your soldiers go? And they hung up and they won't talk to her anymore, which tells you that either these agencies are completely incompetent or they've been told to tell these family members they're in Russia, everything's fine, nothing's happened to them. This, this, this kid could be dead. This person's grandchildren could be dead and she wouldn't know for a long time. That's, that's how volatile the situation is. Uh, Marina's grandson, um, Nikita, was originally a conscript. Uh, men in Russia aged 18 to 27 who do not have an exemption such as studying or looking after young children are drafted in the military for a year, which some countries do. Um, you do have to do military service. But Marina says in Nikita's first few days of service, representatives from the military units arrived in their region hoping to get conscripts to become contracted soldiers. So this is the thing I, try I failed to explain earlier, which is, you know, conscripts only have to go in for a year, but they've said to him, look, you know, join the military essentially, you know, get a per proper salary, all these things. Um, so that's what they wanted. So this, you know, earn a salary. Contractors make up the bulk of Russia's junior service personnel because in certain countries, the only thing they really have is the war economy, especially now in Russia. They convinced him. They told him, you can retire early, you'll have a salary, you'll learn how to drive, which in certain places, you know, impoverished areas, um, that, that's a great sales pitch. You're going to learn how to drive, which will help you in your day-to-day -day life. Retire early, which is great. You learn a salary, a steady income. Nikita became a driver in the mechanised infantry division, but his earnings did not translate into a comfortable standard of living. His monthly salary, 18,000 rubles or $240, 180 pounds, before the ruble crashed, was just enough to get by in rural Russia. And that's another thing where that's going to impact soldiers' morale, where they're going to think, is this even worth it? You know, I'm being paid a pittance. Um, to be sent into a war I don't believe in and he told his grandmother he was expected to pay for uniform and petrol out of his salary which is also further madness like it shows you how kind of ill-prepared the Russian military is like is this why they're running out of of fuel because they can't afford to pay for it because they're expected to pay for their um for, for their own fuel out of their salary that's insane he had free accommodation in barracks, but it was freezing and there was no heating or hot water. So I could imagine morale would be incredibly low in these places anyways. It's difficult to establish how common Nikita's experience is, but the scores of Russian companies who help, find young men, uh, who help young men find loopholes to avoid the draft suggest the army is not seen as an attractive prospect because they're not paying a lot. So why would you join the military? In mid-February, Nikita told his grandmother he was moving to the Ukraine-Belarus border to, quote, guard it. He also told her he had heard they would soon be returning home, which 
kind of goes together with I think this story quite well where you know they were told that they were being moved to the Belarus border to defend it when we know that's where the Russian invasion or that we know that was um, part of the Russian invasion plans to attack from Belarus she is cer- certain her grandson has no idea he would be sent to into combat in Ukraine probably because he wasn't there for that long in the military and also because um they were told they were going there for defensive reasons, not offensive reasons. He said, it's drills and more drills and then we go home. A line repeated by many Russian soldiers' relatives we spoke to. So they are actively lying to um, these people. And the longer this war drags on and the longer these people, these family members, haven't heard from um, the men sent into this war, the more um, dangerous the situation becomes for Russia internally. Because they are going to fear the worst. If you haven't heard from someone in an active war zone, e- even in a few hours, right, you're going to fear the worst, always. Because that's what a war zone is like. Not saying I have personal experience of them, but that's why I imagine it's like. Another woman, Galina, said she only realised her son Nikolai was in Ukraine when... Th- this is this is the crazy one, right? This is genuinely madness, okay? When, when she only realised her son was in Ukraine when her sister spotted his photo on Facebook uh, on the Facebook page of Ukraine's armed forces as a prisoner of war. They didn't know he was deployed until they saw him on social media. And the only reason they know is because the Ukrainian military managed to capture him alive. He could have been killed. They would have had no idea. As a US uh, Pentagon briefing on Friday suggests that a significant number of the men fighting in Ukraine are conscripts and that might account for their inexperience and lack of awareness. What uh, about what they are expected to do, and it might be why they've struggled so much because they weren't told, they weren't conditioned for war. That's the key problem. It appears the men's belief that they were simply on drills rather than being sent into combat was not unique to conscripts, like Marina's grandson Nikita and many of the other men whose relatives we spoke to. Galina's son Nikolai began as a conscript but was now a contracted soldier. And let's not forget that you know the, some of these soldiers in um, Russia seem, uh, I mean, in Ukraine seem very uncomfortable with any sort of confrontation. There was uh, an argument, the, the sunflower argument, some lady, some older lady had with a Russian soldier where he just said, "I don't want to do this." You know, like I don't want to like get into this argument with you, and instead of you know doing what you know soldiers could do in that war zone, which is basically just drag her away or just threaten her, you know he looked very very uncomfortable, very timid, and that was the only that was not the only time we saw that there were a bunch of Russian soldiers who tried to break into um, like a house like a gated housing area, and a bun- a bunch of old people and a dog confronted them and they ran off because they have no barracks, no digs, nowhere to stay by the looks of it, and they struggled under confrontation, they could easily have killed the, these old uh, couple, and just taken their house, they didn't, because I think they were told they'd be welcomed as heroes, and all they get everywhere they go is confrontation, people dropping Molotov cocktails on them, throwing themselves under their tanks, um, you know, that that's why I think that one of the reasons why Russia have struggled so much in this conflict, that and logistical problems, but it goes further to show you these aren't hardened soldiers, at least some of them aren't hardened soldiers in um, in the Ukraine invasion. Some of these people are just poor, um, you know, boys essentially, you know, young men who would drill, draft into a war because they thought they were going for drills and they thought they would get a steady salary out of it. And that's sad. It really is. Galina says she last heard from Nikolai the day before her sister spotted his photo when he told her his unit was near the Ukrainian border. So what we can assume from this is that he was sent in uh, very quickly and within about a day he was captured, which is crazy. Um, She said, I don't know what to do. The media is silent about the fact that our guys were captured. They don't know what or they don't know. And the simple fact is she can go to his um, unit or whoever their contact is and say, look, my son's been captured by the Ukrainian military. What the hell? You guys said he wouldn't even be there. What are they going to say to her? They'll probably probably try and throw in jail. I wouldn't be surprised given what's going on in Russia. Nikolai's girlfriend says he became a contract soldier last December. He's, he's So he's not been he's not been training that long, you know. What are we in? We're in uh, March now, right? Three months. Say a year and three months this guy's been doing drills for. Not a long time uh, to be training. His mother adds there were no other opportunities to earn decent money locally. And this is what happens where you live in impoverished places. You know, other countries do this as well, where they go to impoverished areas and they try and recruit soldiers from those areas because they know, or sorry, recruit people to join the military because they know that's the only opportunity they have, which is sad. It really is that when you, you know you live in a failed economy when the military is your only opportunity to make any decent money. 
He said, my child did not go to Ukraine of his own free will. The commander in chief sent him there, she says. They were, if especially if these soldiers were told that they were going to do, they were going, being sent for defensive actions. I can imagine how scary um, it must be to try and invade um, a country where you know Ru Russia sees Ukraine as a kind of sibling country. That must be very difficult for them to do that. And you know, I'm not saying we should all sympathise with Russian soldiers. How poor, you know, how bad for them. But a lot of the, I think, I'm not going to say a lot. I think some of these people genuinely had no idea what was going on. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I do feel for some of these young dudes who were drafted into a war because of poverty. I, I really do. Says, to be honest, I don't understand what it's all for. She says, in our country, some people have nothing to eat. I don't understand any war, any military action. And that's where a further thing, as the sanctions start biting um, food and you know commodities become more and more expensive, Russia could face an internal revolt here because it has happened in the past. It was a long time ago, but that this, you know, the the Russia, uh, the Russia Japan war was one of the things that sparked the uh, 1905 revolution. And you know, there's only so many people the police can lock up. It really is. To be, um, said, whose door should I knock on to get my child back? And I think she's the one where you know her son was, you know, essentially held as a prisoner of war by the um, the Russian military. I mean, the Ukrainian military. I mean, what what's she supposed to do? How's she supposed to get her kid back? This sense of impetus is shared by um, another mother who the BBC spoke to whose son worked as a contract soldier and was sent away on drills, uh, quote drills. She said, if I knew where he is now, I would have packed up my stuff and gone to these people and begged them for mercy, she says. I mean, th this is the situation right now where they, they have no idea where their kids are. They really don't. Historically, soldiers, um, soldiers' mothers in Russia have been outspoken about how the military has been deployed and treated and have agitated for the authorities to be more open about casualty figures. They played a particularly significant part in agitating against both of Russia's Chechen wars, waging a, a, wide, a widely publicised uh, campaign, and they are incredibly brave for doing so because they could be put in prison. You know, the Russian, the, the Russian police don't play around. A new law passed in the country threatens anyone uh, seen to be spreading what the government deems as fake. But, you know, you've got stories about uh, Russian politicians saying the Ukrainians are shelling themselves. Unless they're arguing that um, the Ukrainians, you know, sort of the Western Ukraine area are shelling the Eastern Ukraine area. That's the only way you could try and justify such a dumb statement. The Russian public have also been exposed to powerful anti-Ukrainian propaganda from the Russian state-run media. The sister of one man she believes is missing in Ukraine uh, said she thought he they must have gone there for good reasons. Said, and now we are called to rallies. To me, it looks like they, Ukraine, have destroyed their own country and now they want to destroy another. Who's the other country they want to destroy? It makes no sense. Ukraine aren't invading here. They're you know on the defensive. They've been invaded. But it shows you how powerful the Russian propaganda machine is, especially since Russia have censored, you know, Twitter and other social media platforms. Ukraine has sought to counter that propaganda with a powerful campaign of its own, a helpline, which is good, but how are they how are people supposed to get access to this helpline? That's a problem. This was described um this was first advertised on day three of what Russia was described as a special military denazi a denazi fire operation that's what you know the tagline is we're going in there to free ukraine of nazis which doesn't make sense a companion telegram channel carries photos of russian pow's and casualties and encourages worried relatives to get in touch the washington post has highlight concerns about the complications of graphic images but this is the only way family members could know about what's happened to their children honestly this is our gesture of goodwill to to the russian mothers ukrainian presidential advisor oloski um astrovich uh, announced a flyer carried on the Ukrainian Interior Ministry face page, uh, Facebook page even goes further making a direct call to Russians to come collect their sons and gives in specific instructions what to do the only thing is they probably won't be able to see those messages because of the censorship uh, we re Ukrainian people in contrast to the Russian president uh, Putin's fascists do not make war with mothers and their captured sons which is you know is further going to drive a wedge between um, you know these people, these mums, and um, the Putin regime, which hopefully happens. Um, despite these appeals, all the relatives we spoke to had no view on the legitimacy of Russia's actions in Ukraine or supported it. But the text message and the text exchange of one woman with her uh, soldier's fiance, which she showed to the BBC, suggested that in the case he did not buy into the Russian rhetoric that they were invading Ukraine to liberate it. So it's not really working that well. The propaganda machine.
This is where it gets a bit weird. He goes in it. He tells his fiance that he's off to on tour around some countries, possibly re referring to Belarus. Before saying he's going to defend the defenseless law. So she said, "Are you joking?" He says, "No, I'm going to war." So I'm assuming the tagline of the uh, Russians were going to go in and defend the defenseless, i.e., um, you know, Ukrainian people from Nazis. And you know, he said law as in you know joke as in that's what they've been told. And he goes, no, I'm going to war. Like that's the only way I kind of read it, but I'm not sure. Russia finally published the death toll. It's something we've spoken about um, before. You know, I think they're lying. They're definitely lying about the death tolls. Um, there's not much more I want to talk about. So what we do is we'll go to our final bit. It's going to be a very long video, but these ones are important. So this is the UN ambassador reading the um, text message thread um, from the. Uh, uh, from the thing we mentioned earlier, from this. So I would like to read from the screen shot of the smartphone, of a smartphone uh, of a killed Russian soldier. That's an actual screenshot from someone who is dead already. Lush. Alyosha. How are you doing? Why has it been so long since you responded? Are you really in, during, in training exercises? Asks the mother of the killed soldier. Moments before he was killed. Mama, I'm no longer in Crimea. I'm not in training sessions. Where are you then? Papa is asking whether I can send you a parcel. What kind of a parcel, Mama, can you send me? What are you talking about? What happened? Mama, I'm in Ukraine. There is a real war raging here. I'm afraid. We are bombing all of the cities together, even, even targeting civilians. We were told that they would welcome us. And they are falling under our armored vehicles, throwing themselves under the wheels and not allowing us to pass. They call us fascists. Mama, this is so hard. And this was several moments before he was killed. Imagine, if you want to just visualize the magnitude of the tragedy. You have to imagine next to you, next to every nameplate of every single country in this General Assembly, more than 30 souls of killed Russian soldiers already. Next to every name of the every single country in this assembly, 30 plus killed Russian soldiers. This is obviously, you know, uh, March 1st. It's been a while since then, nine days. Hundreds of killed Ukrainians. Dozens of killed children. And it goes on and on and on. I've not I've not watched this one. It's captured Russian soldier begs for forgiveness from Ukraine. But, you know, you, you can see from this thread, you know, I wasn't sure if this was just, you know, S tier propaganda because I teared up reading this. But um, the more we kind of read these sorts of stories, the more uh, the more it seems to be true that Russia lied to its um Russia lied to the soldiers and conscripts and other you know other people um about about the war you know Russia sent these people in um they've lied to their family members I mean this top one here is just insane um you know they, they you know he said you know her, her own son said to her look he's in he's in Belarus and then when she contacted his unit they said they said oh you know he's in Russia he hasn't left Russia and she said are you stupid or she said, are you joking? Sorry. And, you know, that tells you that the, they've been told that these agencies have been given a specific tagline. 
and you know people aren't buying it you know she obviously she's not buying she knows her son's in belarus he told her she he was in belarus and you know they all told the tagline just say they haven't left russia unless russia sees belarus as part of its own which it could do but you know that wouldn't make sense but um yeah look i'm gonna leave it there you know how long has this video been going on for 30 minutes i'm gonna leave it there let me know what you think in the comments below like comment share subscribe support the channel on patreon if you can and hopefully i'll see you in the next one